we have it later to share. So welcome. So I was telling you the American Benevolent Society was established in 1868 by Americans who were coming to Mexico. And the main purpose at the time was to help Americans with medical needs so they could, you know, get sick in English, basically. And so it was just a group of Americans helping Americans who had fallen on hard times. And so that is still our mission now, helping Americans in need um, who are here in Mexico, who have come and for a number of reasons have settled here. So we continue, that is our main mission. Um, additionally, we also like to, you know, be a support system for Americans uh, in terms of companionship, help, voter registration, anything that is needed. Right now we're working very um, hand in hand with the U.S. Embassy here in Mexico for voter registration and getting Americans to register and vote in these upcoming elections. Um, so that is a little bit about us. We support, we're a nonprofit, obviously. We support ourselves by running the American Cemetery here in Mexico City and also from donations and memberships from folks like all of you. Um, so if you're not a member, we truly encourage you to become a, a member of the ABS. It is very simple. You can go to our website, absmex.org and click on membership. Um, so please, you know, become members, join us, help us in helping other Americans. And continuing doing activities like this during this pandemic, we've been thrilled to be helping having these virtual hangouts and have so many new faces with us. So welcome. And from that, I will be sharing my screen and I will um, be turning over to Mario Espinosa, who will be introducing our two speakers that we're so thrilled to have today. So I would like to ask all of you, if possible, to mute your microphones unless you are presenting so that we can really pay attention to our speakers. Thank you and welcome everybody. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll uh, start with an introduction uh, of Ruth and Paco. Uh, Liki, can you please move on to the next screen? Thank you. Ruth comes by her proficiency in Latin cuisines by birth, inclination, training, talent, and experience. Born in Panama of Nicaraguan parents, but reared and educated in New York City, she opened the first Mexican restaurant in Princeton, New Jersey in 1980, receiving two stars from the New York Times. Also trained in classic French technique, the longtime IACP member founded the Mexico Cooking School in 2004 which was recognized by Sabor Magazine as one of the top five cooking schools in Mexico City. She is a bilingual chef and organizes culinary cultural tours. So please contact her to set up a personal tour. Her contact information, um, as you can see, can be found on the slide. Uh, Ruth is the IACP's country coordinator for Mexico. She is a founding member and convivian leader of Slow Food Condesa Roma and a spokesperson at the CCGM. Everyone, please welcome Ruth Alegria. Now, Francisco de Santiago, or Paco, as he's known by, was born in Mexico City on March 2nd, 1967. At the age of 18, he began a professional career as a bullfighter, traveling for several years throughout all of Mexico City. He has since primarily worked with foreign visitors. He's given cultural tours in Guanajuato, Querétaro, Zacatecas, San Luis Potosí, the Mexico City metro area, which includes uh, Teotihuacan, among other states in southern Mexico. In 1910, he returned to Mexico City under the tutelage of Ruth Alegría and began culinary tours in several cities, including the Ciudad de México, Puebla, among others. Starting in 2012, he was incorporated into Leslie Teles' team, Eat Mexico, offering street food tours. He was an early pioneer of this popular type of food tour, uh, I'm sorry, of this type of tour experience in Mexico. Baco has been the lead guy for Culinary Backstreets in Mexico City, a company with worldwide presence. He has had the opportunity to collaborate in the making of documentaries, in journalistic coverage, culinary investigations, tours, both food and cultural, as well as top classes for chefs and restaurant owners. His clients include the Culinary Institute of America, the BBC, and chefs Rick Bayless, Sean O'Toole, John Soilis, Rick Stein, Ivy Comforty, and Tom, Tommy Payne. 
Baku was recently featured in the Netflix documentary series, The Taco Chronicles, which came out last year. The Canasta episode obtained the 2020 James Beard Best Location Award. During the pandemic lockdown, he has conducted two series of live Instagram conversations titled The Gonde Chronicles with chefs and experts discussing Mexican culture and cuisine. These talks can be viewed on Culinary Backstreet's Instagram. Those handles will be shared in the chat, in the chat just shortly. Also, this presentation will be made available on our social media platforms. We encourage you to please uh, like our Facebook page and follow the ABS, Ruth, and Baco on our social media platforms. Thank you all uh, for joining us today, and let's get started with this fun and exciting talk on chiles and nogadas. Um, I now hand it over to both uh, Ruth and Paco. Well, uh, th thank you very much. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Hola, Ruth. How are you doing? Uh, well, um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure for both of us to to be here in this virtual conference. I hope that, that you enjoy it. And um, well, um, I'm going to start talking about the the history and the origin. If you want to move Aliki the, the next um, um, slide. The next one? And, yeah, the next one, yeah. And, um, well, uh, um, no, um, I think that we were forward to, yeah. There? There, there. Let's let's stop there. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, the history uh, and origin of the Chile Nogada um, it is very interesting because um, it is it has been a, a dish that today uh, has become like the 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 flagship of the Mexican cuisine uh, and has gone over the frontiers of uh, of Mexico as uh, maybe uh, as famous as the uh, mole, um, as a national dish, no? Uh, what's the origin of the Chile Nogada? Uh, apparently, we can um, keep track uh, of the very first recipes about chiles in a very, in a very old book that dates from the uh, second half of the 19th century. And that um, compiles many recipes and techniques that were uh, created pretty much in the convents. You are watching on the left photo, it's uh, the convent of uh, Santa Monica, uh, run by uh, Agustina, uh, Agustinos Nonces. And on the right uh, picture, you are watching uh, one of the little chapels known as Capilla Esposas of uh, the town of Calpan that we are going to talk about uh, this important place uh, not far from Puebla city and in between the, 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 the mountains, the volcanoes. Um, that's very important for the developing of the Chile Nogada. So let's go to the next one. Yes, uh, uh, to understand the, 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 the importance, the cultural importance of uh, of this dish, you know, most of the Mexican dishes, they have been linked somehow to the history and the culture. Uh, let's uh, run uh, briefly um, a timeline. The pre-Hispanic civilizations that established in what is today Mexico, known as Mesoamerica, they started its raising uh, cultures in um, about 2500 BC, all the way to uh, the arrival of Cortes and the destruction of uh, Mexico Tenochtitlan in 1521. This means that after this date, the Spanish domination of uh, Mexico lasted for exactly 300 years, from uh, 1521 to 1821. Uh, nevertheless, we celebrate, as may, may, maybe many of you already know, we celebrate Independence Day, uh, the date that we started this independence revolution. In the image, you can see Father Hidalgo, who is with the raising hand and the, and the flag carrying, he's carrying the flag of the Virgen de Guadalupe, one of the first icon that gives unity and identity to Mexicans. So this is why uh, uh, beyond the religious uh, uh, um, uh, importance, uh, it is very important to create this uh, identity among 
the new nation that uh, at that moment, uh, Mexico still doesn't even have its name, no? Uh, uh, and they are uh, struggling, uh, trying to figure out what is going to happen after the independence. So we can see the, the other leaders of um, in the independence uh, revolution. We can see Allende, we can see Abasolo, we can see Morelos, we can see Guerrero that today has his own, his own state in Guerrero. That you, you, all of you, you know, because of the uh, Acapulco uh, city, you know, beautiful Acapulco beach. And the, the general on the left, on the extreme left is uh, Agustin Iturbide. He is the general that is going to make this uh, peace agreement with uh, Vicente Guerrero that is next to him. And they are going to consummate the independence of, of Mexico. And before I continue with this, um, I have some questions for you that I'm going to start making along the presentation. Um, and I'm going to uh, drop one, so we can uh, answer these questions at the end. Uh, number one question is, which Mexican city became the World Trade Center during the 18th century? And the second question I'm going to drop right now is, please name main Nogada sauce ingredient. We are going to, to uh, discuss this at the very end. So uh, continue with uh, the discussion about the history of Mexico. Um, when the, the, ro the royal soldiers headed by Iturbide and the rebels, the insurgents uh, commanded by Vicente Guerrero, they decided to stop fighting and consummate the independence in the favor of the Mexicans. Uh, they decided to create a flag. It was an ejército trigarante, ejército de las tres garantías. So which one were these three guarantees that the, 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 the rebels uh, would present to the society? It was uh, represented or symbolized by the three colors of the Mexican flag. Uh, the red color was uh, the symbol for the union not only between locals in Mexico, but also the union between uh, Mexicans and Spanish, as many of the Creoles or the son of the Spanish already born in Mexico, they didn't have political rights or uh, didn't have opportunity to take control of, of its own country. So this is what represents the red color at this moment. Then for the white color, uh, this is, uh, represents the Catholic religion. Uh, the revolution of Mexico is going to be headed uh, by many leaders. Many of them, they were priests. They were, they were fathers. And um, on the other hand, uh, most of the uh, Mexicans, they practice already uh, the Catholic religion. So that's the meaning for the, for the white color. And the green color represents independence. Independence of uh, Mexico from Spain. This is what, uh, what it means these three colors of on the Mexican flag. And uh, we go, Aliki, to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we are going to, to see how um, these three colors are linked to the dish. And they are going to be uh, presented uh, at the table uh, uh, showing these beautiful three colors. Uh, so uh, let's use... Um, uh, consider some questions, some um, I, um, things regarding the Chile Nogada. Uh, the Chile Nogada is probably a Baroque dish created in one of the many convents of Puebla. Uh, and um, th th this is because Puebla became the World Trade Center during the 18th century due to its strategical location between Veracruz and Mexico City. Puebla is going to be uh, uh, the, the, the commercial center of the world at this time because uh, the Spanish are going to run this commercial activity uh, between Acapulco, Port, and Manila, the Philippine Islands or the Spice Islands as they were known by that time. So for almost uh, 300 years, uh, Mexico is going to get uh, all kinds of goods and uh, even, of course, human beings and goods uh, from that part of the world 
known as China by that time, of course. So we, uh, we call this, uh, this ship the Galeon de Manila or the now de la China, because once a year it arrived with uh, all these beautiful porcelain and uh, silk, uh, mangoes and, and many products from, from that part of, of the world. So um, these uh, products were highly appreciated by the uh, Europeans, as you know, um, one of the purposes of Columbus, it was uh, not to discover a new continent, but to uh, find a way to get to the Spice Islands. They were highly appreciated in Europe, and once in Mexico, they were transported from Acapulco to Mexico City and Puebla, as it was in the way to Veracruz port to ship it to Spain. And as well, Puebla is going to get from Spain, uh, coming uh, from the port of Veracruz, all the European goods. So Puebla reunites uh, many uh, ingredients that are going to become part of the Mexican cuisine of the future. And uh, this is how this Baroque dish could have been created, probably, probably in the convents, because these monasteries and convents, they would have the access. This was for wealthy families that, that could afford them, or uh, institutions like the, uh, the Catholic Church that were very important and powerful, and they would uh, have the possibility to obtain the best from the three worlds. So this is a dish that un un uh, reunites uh, spices and ingredients from all over the, the world. Um, and now talking about um, what's the first recipe that appears in the, in the, um, uh, in the cookbooks about the Chile and Nogada, you can move to the to the next um, slideshow. To the next slide, please. Um, here we see again the the um, the map of Puebla that is in the in the right uh, down corner, and we see the town of Calpan almost in the center above the the, the tractor. Uh, Calpan is this, the place where most of the ingredients are cultivated to prepare the chile nogada. So the first recipe uh, appears in a cookbook. I know you can, if you watch my uh, my uh, my image here, um, this book is going to come at the end of the of the presentation, uh, and is the Cocinero Mexicano. This is uh, a book that was printed in 1831. So this is the the first day that we can find not not the dish as we know it today but the technique to create a nogada, which is a, a white sauce made of mainly uh, nuez de castilla. Ruth is going to explain later what this consists of, the nuez de castilla, what is that? And I don't want to kill uh, all um, our time. Um, and uh, let me uh, just tell you that uh, the authentic Chile and nogada really, really requires uh, a very specific fresh ingredients that many of them, they can be obtained in Calpan. In this is the, the, the map that I am showing uh, to you uh, right now. Calpan is a very little rural town that has a very beautiful monastery from the 16th century. It's one of the, the, the world the heritage of Mexico. And it's a town right in between Puebla City and the volcanoes, the Popocatépetl. And there you can find uh, many of the ingredients for the chile nogada. Now, if, if we move ahead, Aliki, please. Um, no, um, on the other direction. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the next one. No, that's the same one. Oh, oh, mm, no. La historia, esta está, dice, eh, historia breve del chile nogada. No, that's... Uh, Okay, okay, here we are, yes. All right, sorry, okay. No so uh, the, the Chile and Nogada has evolved with the passing of the time, thanks to the boom for Mexican cuisine and the new racing generation of young Mexican chefs that they have uh, make reinterpretation of the classical recipes that were born in Puebla. Uh, nevertheless, most of them are very respectful as we're going to see quickly in the images uh, of the ingredients. Nah? But for Poblano, Chile Nogada is a symbol of local pride and it represents also 
uh, uh, still this uh, eager for independence and, uh, uh, and and local pride, as I said before, no, as it is tied to the history of Mexico. Every year, I have to say that me many Mexicans, uh, we many locals, we organize culinary pilgrimages to Puebla during September, mainly to enjoy these chiles and nogada, uh, to make it part of the Independence Day celebrations, no? Uh, I have to say that uh, chile nogada is an expensive dish uh, um, if you want to cook it with the, with the right ingredients, no? And Ruth is going to explain later about this. Then if we want to run the next photo, Saliki, please. <laughs> oh, this is a, a, an interesting survey that uh, is a question of the 10 million pesos, no? How do you prefer your chiles and nogada, butter or not butter? And then the next one, please. Do you want me to launch the poll or do it, save it for later? I'll launch, launch the poll if you want, please. Okay, so we'll ask everyone to please answer. Um, on your screen, you have two options. How do you prepare your chiles and nogada, either battered or not battered? I voted already. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have about a third of you have already voted. Why is there a choice? Ooh, here comes the controversy. Ah! Okay, anyone else? We'll learn that voted? later, sure. Okay, so we're almost <laughs> done. Everyone voted? Is anyone not voted? Okay, I will end the poll and share the results. Can you see them? Oh, wow, Ooh. yeah. 58% <laughs> <laughs> butter. Yeah, wow. Traditionalists wow. here, real traditionalists. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm oh, proud of you guys. <laughs> so, so we, have, we have knowing folks here among us, people who really know how to eat. All right. Could, would you like me to go to the next slide? Yeah, let's go to the next slide because I want to give the micro microphone to, to Ruth. Uh, this is uh, one of the ways uh, that we present the, the chile nogada. This is a beautiful uh, chile nogada that it is made surprisingly in Morelia. But uh, please note the three colors of the Mexican flag uh, represented by the Granada, no? uh, the perejil and the, and the white sauce. No? This is serving this very beautiful plate that has the uh, our national symbol, the, e the eagle eating the snake, uh, which is an, an Aztec uh, symbol, no? Uh, next one. This is the classical uh, uh, um, way to, to, to serve the dish, the dish. This is a butter, a butter chile and nogada. This is made in by a housewife in Puebla. This is how poblanos, they, they love it. The, and the next one, please. This is uh, a chile and nogada that Ruth and myself, we enjoyed two weeks ago in, in, uh, in one of the most famous restaurants in Puebla. Uh, and this is like a, a, a well, the contemporary pres uh, presentation. No? This is how it is presented in, in, in most of the restaurants uh, of Mexico City and Puebla. The next one, please, please, please the next me. image. <laughs> You see my screen, I apologize. It's telling me that I paused it. I just want to make sure everything, everyone can see the screen correctly. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. So next slide. Aliki, next slide. You know have what, hang on. Wait, we have, let me, that was the problem I was telling you about. We, I, for some reason, my screen share paused. Let me go back and Sorry, let me go back to all these wonderful pictures. I think that's where we left off, correct? Yeah, that's where we yeah. left. So next Sorry one. about that, apologies. It's fine, no problem. This is a, a very interesting um, presentation. This is a place that serves mole in the center of Mexico City, Some, a restaurant that serves pretty much mole and, and moladas. But every season, they have only two or three days that they offer the chile nogada and and you have to almost like make a reservation because they run over very quickly. Uh, this chile, as um, one of our friends were asking about, how do you serve chile and nogada with? 
In this case, is is not a classical presentation, but it has this red rice, no, on the same plate, and it comes better. So next uh, uh, picture, please. Uh, this is a, a homemade uh, chile uh, nogada that respects most of the ingredients. You can see how the thickness of the of the nogada, uh, the pomegranates on top, and the perejil on the side. But it's not bothered. This chile, uh, we say in Mexico, está encuerado. It doesn't have the the conventional preparation of the of the butter. And many chefs they they don't butter the cheese anymore. No. Uh, this is what we are going to learn uh, with Ruth in the next minutes. Next picture, please, Aliki. Uh, this is another uh, um, restaurant in Mexico City that they focus on, believe it or not, they just started serving Chinese food and then uh, they became experts in Mexican cuisine. So if you really want to try authentic Mexican cuisine in Mexico City, one of the places to go are the Chinese coffees or Chinese restaurants, uh, believe it or not, that today they serve a few Chinese dishes, but they're masters on uh, Mexican cuisine. So this is a very uh, flavorful, very delicious chile that look at the thickness of the of the of the nogada with the white sauce is very is very thick, no. And in this case, it's served with the um, with a white rice. Ne next picture, please. Uh, this is another contemporary uh, dish. No, hola, uh, Kalisa. I think I see Kalisa there. Hola, hola Kalisa. Taco. Nice to see hola. you. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, this is in a restaurant of downtown in Mexico City, and this this dish breaks with the tradition because it's not butter. The 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 sauce, the nogada is not white and it has this yellow rice, very strange, and carrot. This is not the way, if you present this chile in, in Puebla, you can Ooh. be easily beheaded. So <laughs> next, uh, <laughs> please. And this is a warning, oh no, uh, that one. Please stop there. This is a warning Sorry. for all of us. Please, please never do this. <laughs> this is what I found at Sam's. <gasps> no, 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 no. Instant chile and nogada that you can buy at Sam's. Please never do this, as we are going to learn uh, uh, with Ruda Alegría why uh, the chile and nogada cannot be easily replicated. And if you are eating things like this, um, maybe it is food, yes, but it is not a chile and nogada. So um, don't let uh, people to fool you about uh, they're giving you uh, a chile and nogada and it is not. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead with the last two questions uh, for you. Uh, one question is, in what year Mexico consummate its independence from Spain? This is for you to answer at the end. And please name the chile and nogada birthplace. So I think that we can, we can go to the next uh, image. Aliki, please. And this is the time to Ruth to speak. Thank you. Sorry about eating a little bit of your time, Ruth, but this is the where to find ingredients. Thank you, Paco. I think he, he left none, nothing to chance. I think we've learned a lot about the chile and nogada, including the fact that it is a very, very iconic dish arguments back and forth between its origins, battered or not battered, what should be served with it, questions that will go on forever. But to do a real chile en nogada, the first thing that you have to do is where do you find the ingredients? This is a wonderful picture uh, that Paco took in the Central de Abastos, the largest wholesale market of the Americas. And the woman is holding a very large packet. I would say that's at least perhaps three kilos, six pounds of the peeled walnuts, packed, vacuum packed, ready to go. And in front of her is one of the very little known, but in my opinion, really worthwhile ingredient that you should add to the chiles ignorada uh, stuffing. Uh, the yellowish square 
um, packets that are in front of her are of acitron. And the acitron is a candied bisnaga cactus. It is not like the European acitron. So this is something totally different, but it has that sweetness and the texture where you have a little bite to it when you add it to certain dishes. And it's an essential ingredient, not just in the picadillo, in the um, meat stuffing for the chiles en nogada, but also uh, for me, if you make a mole de olla and you don't put in a citron, it's not a true mole de olla. Next. And this is another shot of the Central de Abasto, which is in Iztapalapa. Uh, Paco and I have both gone there. We've gone there with chefs. It's absolutely overwhelming. You can find anything that you need there. Next. Now, this is the Mercado Medellin. And what we're seeing, of course, in, to me, it's the upper right-hand corner, are the walnuts that have not been shelled yet. Uh, and previously, we saw the woman holding a package of the peeled walnuts. I'll go into uh, why a lot of people prefer to buy their walnuts already peeled and cracked. But what I want to show you is uh, the lower picture of the woman sifting through the apples. I'd like you to notice how small those apples are. Now we'll get into why do we only have chiles en nogada during the season that encompasses late July to very early October. And some people will not serve uh, chiles en nogada um, after Independence Day, all right? So part of the reason for that is that the essential ingredients, according to the Puebla recipe, needs to be certain fruits that you can only find uh, in Puebla, especially in Calpan, which has now dedicated itself to growing these fruits, are the manzana pan ochera, which is a small, very toothy, it has a very nice uh, texture to it. It doesn't break down when it's cooked. Uh, the peras, uh, the San Juan, the pears are also, they're firm. Uh, they're uh, sweet. Um, uh, the other is the peaches, the duraznos. Again, um, they are firm and all of these give texture to your picadillo, to the meat filling. Next. All right, here we see some, <laughs> we see some of our friends shopping for the walnuts that are not uh, yet uh, cracked, but uh, uh, Lourdes, our friend in the uh, sleeveless uh, shirt, she has a package which I would think are the cracked and cleaned walnuts. It's very difficult to clean these walnuts. First of all, you have to take out the outer hard shell and then within the walnuts, and I just spoke to a good mm -hmm. friend of mine who uh, actually uh, runs a small restaurant and he said, you know, my sauce is turning out yellowish and I don't know why. And I said, well, uh, first of all, um, do you soak your walnuts in milk? And he says, why would I do that? <laughs> well, first of all, you don't know how old the walnuts are. And again, this is the seasonal crop of walnuts. You want very, very fresh walnuts. Because when you break open the hard shell within the walnut, it still has a skin on it. The very young walnuts, um, you will see that the skin adheres to the meat of the walnut uh, very thickly. Some people will blanch it to make it easier to peel off that skin, but you must take off the peel. And when I was describing this to him, he says, what peel, what, what, what skin are you talking about? And it came to light. If you don't peel it all the way down past that very thin skin, which sometimes you can barely see, you're sauce will be slightly bitter and a, and a darker color. Next, please. So here we have some of the different ingredients, including the acitron is front and center, the apples behind it. And to one side, another ingredient, some people will use almonds, sliced diced almonds, others won't. Next, please. Again, the walnuts and of course, the other prime ingredient are the pomegranates, very fresh, very red uh, kernels to the pomegranate. Um, you can see in the cracked walnuts that the meat is really very, very white. And that's what you're looking for in a walnut, a full 
uh, nut casing where the meat has not pulled away from the shell. The little teeny tiny things, but they can make a difference. Next, please. Uh, the pera. Uh, all right, so as you can see, it, it's a very darker skid. It's fairly large considering the man's hand. And again, a very firm texture. Next, please. Now we're going to start with a cooking class that I took with a master chef who I really admire. And he has many restaurants uh, at the moment. Well, he has actually three restaurants at the moment. Uh, but one of his uh, main seasons is the season during um, uh, late July into early October where he features chiles en nogadas, not just from Puebla. Everyone has their own version. Uh, we were talking to Mario prior to when we were setting up this hangout. And uh, I think we, we surprised him with many of the things that we told him about the Chile Segnogada. So uh, what I'd like you to see is um, he has his mise en place, his preparation uh, with the Nogada sauce. He's got the walnuts, he has some almonds, he has some cheese, some cream, and some Jerez sherry. Uh, what you see in the upper uh, right hand picture is the sauteing of the fruits, which should be done in a little butter and oil. I always like the butter oil combination. Um, and you can see that it's a fine dice. You want to have uh, that so that when you are um, eating the chile and nogada, you're going to get a little bite of all of the fruits. So you don't want to have very large pieces. You need to make them fairly small. Next. Now on the left hand side we're seeing the picadillo or the ground meats already cooked and I want to go into that. Um, there's also besides the battered not battered uh, argument there's also an argument for shredded meat as opposed to the ground beef. Here we're seeing a ground beef, which is the most popular now, but um, the chef in question, who you can see here, he does, during the uh, Chile and Nogada season, he does about five or six different styles of chili. And one of them is with the shredded beef, which is quite an interesting texture to have when you're having a chile en nogada. And he bases this on his investigations. And one of his books, which if you can read Spanish, and until the University of Texas, Austin, comes out with the English version, he has a book called the La Rus Encyclopedia Diccionario, Encyclopedia Dictionary of Mexican Gastronomy. And it's a wonderful book. It has no recipes, it's over 500 pages. It's all the information you could ever want on the ingredients, the places, the history, the legends, everything you could want on um, Mexican gastronomy. So what you're seeing here is a ground picadillo. Now we come to another question. Should it be all beef or can it be beef and pork? I prefer mine with beef and pork. I also prefer mine with uh, so many of the other ingredients that you can have in a picadillo, which begins with, of course, the fruit that's added to the picadillo once the picadillo is sauteed. Then you would start with a very simple um, onion, garlic. Then you could put in your raisins. I actually like golden raisins. You can see that these are darker raisins. And to flavor the beef, uh, or the mixture of beef and pork, which is my favorite, beef and pork, you would do a, a fresh tomato sauce, you would do uh, your cinnamon, you would do uh, a few bits of almonds, you would also have a uh, clavo, um, uh, which is um, clove, uh, and uh, in um, as well, did I do them all? Clavo, canela, the, um, the pasas, which are my favorite, and the almendras. Okay, so next. Now here, tips on how to clean your chilies. There are various ways to clean your chilies, all right? The ones we're seeing here were lightly fried, all right, and then peeled. The texture to the chili should have some tooth to it. It should not be all soggy and wet. I will never ever put a chili into a plastic bag. If you put a chili into a plastic bag for more than a minute, 
the moisture from the interior of the chili, if you haven't slid it open so that some of the steam will escape, it still is encapsulated in the plastic bag. You will get a very soft and falling apart chili. So we don't do that. I prefer to roast the chilies over an open gas flame. Here they were fried very lightly, very quickly, and the skin taken off with a knife. One of the other secrets is the minute that you've either fried or roasted your chili over an open gas flame, cut a slit in the side, let the steam escape, and put in some paper towels to absorb the rest of the uh, steam, of the moisture, the humidity. Now, in the uh, picture next to uh, the chiles, we're seeing uh, the chef preparing, beginning to prepare the nogada sauce. And what we're seeing is unflavored goat cheese. Uh, next slide, please. The nogada sauce can have so many different ingredients and a great many people prefer adding cream cheese. Tell that to a Puebloan. Again, yes, you'll be beheaded. Cream cheese does have stabilizers, so it helps to stabilize the sauce. But a nogada sauce should not truly be made and then kept for long hours. It should be the ultimate step before you're going to present your chili. It really should be one of the last things you make. And then what do you have in the nogada sauce? Well, of course, it's walnuts. Some people put in uh, milk. Uh, some people prefer to put in creme fraiche. Some people prefer cream cheese. Others prefer a white cheese, any of the uh, fresh white cheeses of Mexico. And then um, in older recipes, it's an unflavored, slightly acidic goat cheese. So you've got these walnuts. You have uh, the cheese, your choice. And then what's the liquid that you're going to use to help liquefy it? Because as you can see, he's putting it into a blender. Again, many choices. You could, um, I would not add the milk that you uh, keep your walnuts in. Uh, when you buy them, you should keep them either in a little water or in milk. I wouldn't use that milk. I'd throw that milk out if you wanted to use milk as the liquid, a little bit of milk. But one of the things that I always use because I think it gives it a great flavor. And again, in the older versions, you would use a dry sherry. So, all of these liquids would be what would you would use to liquefy the sauce. And then as you're liquefying it, you would, you would always test for texture because you, you do not want a very loose sauce. If your chilies are well dried and it's not battered, I, I admit I prefer not battered. <laughs> All right, because I want to get the full flavor of the chili. So you've made a slit in the chili, you've dried it out, you've taken out the seeds. You have to take out the seeds because the seeds all the way at the top of the root of the chili can be quite hot, can be quite spicy. Some people like to leave a few of the seeds in for that spiciness, but it all depends again on that year's chili crop. Is it too hot? Is it not too hot? Uh, can you start to see there's a pattern here? The number of variations is extreme. And a lot of it has to do, how do you want your nogada to taste? The other um, uh, ingredient that you always add to a nogada, because you're using a dry sherry, you're not using a sweet sherry. So you want a little sweetness to it. The fruits in the picadilla will give you some sweetness, but to balance out the flavor also of the goat cheese and the sherry, you should always add a touch of sugar and a pinch of salt, which is very much a French tip in cooking, especially in salad dressings. You always use some sweetness and a bit of salt. Next slide. Let's see how far we're getting onto, onto this. Now, for this class, we were all, we were about 30 people, we were all having a chili. You can see that the chili here has already been stuffed. And for this presentation, I prefer not to have the stuffing overflowing from the top. I prefer to put in the stuffing fold over the ends of the chile poblano and then end the stuffing. All right, oh, here comes another discussion. 
Should the, should the stuffing be hot, warm, room temperature, or cold? The two first and last. No, it shouldn't be piping hot, and no, it shouldn't be cold. It should be lukewarm or at room temperature. So you've prepared your picadillo, you've had it in your saucepan, it's not getting cold. You stuff your chilies. This, again, avoids any steam buildup in the chile. You wrap your chili around the stuffing. I prefer to put my, uh, as are shown here, upside down. And then you plate it. Next, next slide, please. So here is a very simple presentation. The sauce is not too thick. It's not too thin. You have the parsley on top. You have the pomegranates. This is, to me, a wonderful chile en nogada. Now, when we were seeing all the other pictures that Paco had put for us to look at, some of the sauces were very, very thin, which definitely should not be. Some of the sauces were too thick to the point of their almost being uh, almost like a frosting. Again, shouldn't be. It should have a thick consistency that adheres to the chili. And now again, how smooth should the sauce be? A great many people who had both almonds and the walnut being the primary ingredient, prefer to leave some chunky bits when they're liquefying the sauce. Others feel that it should be a really creamy, smooth sauce. Again, it's up to you to decide. Do you want a few little chunks that will tell you this is a walnut, there's a little bit of almond? You could also, towards the end, if you like, crush some almonds and some walnuts and just sprinkle them either around the plate or on top of the chili. Next, please. Uh, I think this is a wonderful uh, table setting, which is the pomegranates and the fresh chile poblanos in and amongst some uh, flowers. And then you can see in this chile, it's not overstuffed. As you cut it open, you can see little bits of the fruit. You can see uh, the ground meat and you can see the sauce has some consistency to it. This to me is a great chili. And not that I don't like battered chile en nogada, I think it takes away from the flavor of the chile and I really love chile poblanos. Uh, next please. So here, which is what I was hoping we could do, we have uh, one of the recipes um, when this is uh, put up on the ABS um, uh, social media websites, you'll be able to go through the video and you can stop at this particular page and you can see it's in Spanish. There are very few uh, English language uh, chiles en nogada recipe that I like, even though I just found one from the New York Times uh, by Rick Martinez, who's a chef, and it wasn't a bad uh, recipe in English. So if you go into the New York Times, into their cooking session, you'll be able to see Chile en Nogada and the chef Rick Martinez. His was, I think, uh, the best of the recipes there. But this is a uh, Mexican cookbook, um, which is the Gastronomia Mexicana, another La Rousse book. And you'll see that it has all of the ingredients for the stuffing, which is the relleno, it gives you the optional ingredients for the batter, the, capa, the capallado, and then there are in the ingredients for the nogada, and then there are the presentation ingredients. Most chiles en nogadas to be done right have between 20 and 30 ingredients, all right? So it is a bit of work to put out an authentic or traditional or great tasting chile en nogada. Next, please. This will be another recipe that we had, which is chiles en nogada contemporaneos, contemporary. And that's because the uh, unbattered are considered contemporary chiles en nogadas. Next, please. And here is one where you wait until you're at the table to do your sauce and you can see the stuffing. All right, next please. And then I wanted to show you that there is a recipe for chiles en nogada in the style of Atlisco, which is again, another town in Puebla. 
There are many, many different towns. There are many, many different regions in Mexico and everyone has their own method of making a chile en nogada. Next, please. I'm hoping I'm not going too slow. This is a battered one. When you have a battered one, people ask you, well, I thought the chile en nogada, it was the green of the chili. It's not really the green of the chili that is supposed to represent the green of the flag. It's the parsley that's supposed to be the green of the flag, the green parsley, the red pomegranates, and the white sauce. And as you can see, this is a very creamy, smooth sauce. Next, please. This picture has a much granular sauce, and you'll see that they have put in a few bits of the walnuts and the almonds. Next, please. And here we come to the bibliography, the books that we uh, like to use. Um, so shall we turn it over to uh, Mario now? And I think, is there another one after um, that picture of the bibliography? <laughs> I can't hear you. Aliki? I no think audio. Aliki got frozen. Aliki has no audio. Neither no, I. I'm okay. sorry, I had muted. I stopped sharing the presentation. Let me share it again. Sorry, I thought that was the end of it and we were gonna open to questions. Well, give we'll me, open to questions, but you could leave me. the pictures of the bibliography and just keep going through them. Sure. Okay, give me one second. I will share the screen again. Uh, sorry about that. All right, so this was the, the bibliography. It was, here we go. There were three pages. Do you want to talk about them or should I just flip through them? No, I think, you know, these are in Spanish. Uh, there are none in English that we recommend. I'm sorry. Uh, this was the uh, dictionary encyclopedia that I was telling you uh, of. It's a great 500 page book, no recipes. Next. And then in Mexico, the Desconocido, which is a wonderful magazine, they have the secrets of the Chile Segnogada. So uh, something that you might be able to pick up during this month if they're still available. And then uh, was there one more? No. Oh, and there we go. There we go. Oh, and there are our social media pages. I think we had one question from Amy Sherman, did we? Go go ahead. So I think we can open it to um, to questions. I will um, we will share all of this information with all of you. So I will go ahead and stop sharing the screen as the presentation is over, so that you can all see each other. Um, thank oh. you so much. This this has been fantastic. Um, Amy I'm, Sherman has a great question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Talking yeah, she's talking about a restaurant in San Francisco that includes pine nuts. All right, so when we talk about the pine nuts, you have to talk about the pink pine nuts that are available in Mexico City. They're not your normal pine nuts. So yes, you can include the pine nuts in the stuffing, in the picadillo, not as part of the nogada sauce. The only, the main ingredient of a nogada sauce are the walnuts, some people will add the almonds because you know you can make almond butter. So almonds are an also another way to get a creaminess and a thickness to the sauce. Um, the not battered, again, Amy, sorry, that's the big question here. <laughs> Some people absolutely adhere to tradition. And in Puebla, you go to a restaurant and they won't even ask you. You will be served a battered chile en nogada. So I think that answers uh, Amy's question. Um, I, as, as you can tell, there's a little, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Okay, my question is the one that I posed at the beginning. We saw that uh, the chilies were served once with red uh, rice and once with white rice. Ruth, when you serve a chili in Nogada, do you serve anything to accompany it? Nothing. Okay. The flavors of the chile and nogada are so defined that to put rice, which in, if you serve plain white rice, it's a neutered to me flavor. Rice is meant to soak up sauces. That's why it's perfect for Chinese food. It's perfect for, you know, a paella. So, because it absorbs flavors. But when you're doing a chile and nogada, 
if your chile zingarada are of a good size, one should be enough. And I've had some chile zingarada where I have to say halfway through, I think that's it. I can't eat anymore. You could do a salad beforehand okay. for your chile zingarada. I, I was going to ask, what would you serve before the chile, and what sort of a dessert would you serve if you? Oh. On the dessert, I'm going to let Paco address that one because we had the most wonderful dessert that was served in uh, the restaurant that we went to in Puebla. It's called El Mural de los Poblanos, and it's a very traditional dessert. Paco, do you want to speak about the, the green pumpkin seed uh, fondant covered bun we had after, after our chile en nogada? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, among the, the the culinary traditions of Puebla, uh, mainly from the convents and monasteries, there were there was a, a very strong tradition of uh, creating these uh, sweets, or we call it dulces típicos. And these sweets they started with ingredients like camote, no sweet potato. And they, as they wouldn't have almonds at the very beginning of the Spanish domination in Mexico, they would start trying other ingredients and they found out about the pumpkin seeds. We call it pepita de calabaza. And with this pepita de calabaza, they started making these very famous tortitas de Santa Clara. And then they, they evolved to this, uh, let me see if I can uh, turn my, my camera. So this is, can you see it now? Yeah. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a mollete. The, the bread on the right is, uh, is called mollete. The other uh, is um, ice cream. But the mollete, it is uh, a special bread that has um, baking cream, uh, crema pastelera inside. Uh, and the shell, the cover, is made of this uh, uh, pepita de calabaza and coconut shavings. Uh, the mollete should not be um, um, uh, confused with the, with the roll that has beans and cheese in most of the ta um, towns of Mexico, but this is a sweet mollete and it is a big, big, big one. So this is what the poblanos, they would love to share, uh, to have as a dessert after the uh, they have enjoyed the chile en nogada. Which I think brings us back. A chile, uh, the picadillo to the chili shouldn't be very sweet. The picadillo stuffing should not be sweet. The nogada sauce should not be sweet. Um, some people have also asked, uh, what should you serve with the chile en nogada? Well, whatever your favorite beverage is. But having spoken to at least two sommeliers, uh, what they recommend is a very dry sherry to accompany the chile nogada, a sherry fino as part of the dinner. I thought that was a great idea. And then like so many of um, the sommeliers are going, you know what Mexican food goes great with? And since this is a celebratory uh, dish, champagne. <laughs> but again, a dry champagne. So because of the sweetness to the chile en nogada that some people perceive, uh, you'd want to serve something that's dry, a dry white wine, a, a dry sherry, or a, a very sec champagne. And I just want to go back to when Paca was talking about uh, the Galeón de Manila, uh, this famous ship that came uh, from the Philippines, from the uh, Manila area, but it actually originated in Asia. And so many of the ingredients, which is why you probably won't find it before uh, the 1800s mentioned in uh, Mexican uh, food lore, is because the ingredients are a mixture of Asian spices, fruits from old Spain, which probably came from the Moors, as well as the um, cinnamon and the cloves are very Moorish, all right? So this is a true mestizo dish, but of a very high, higher class, because this is what would be served to 
uh, very important guests in family homes and in the convents and monasteries. So I see we have three more questions or three more comments. I have. Oh. So we have, let me, the, the comments, so we have from Barbara Franco t sharing with us that her mother-in-law used to make exquisite chile tenogadas. It would take five women at least <laughs> a, over a week for shopping and cooking for 28 family members. And she still has a handwritten recipe down from her mother-in-law. So that's mm. a fantastic piece of history. Um, and then uh, Amy Sherman is asking, is this more of a common as a restaurant dish or a home cooked dish? Well, I think I'd like to answer that. It, we used to have big families. We don't anymore. And in the time of the pandemic, this would be a very difficult dish for one person to do. I know that even when I was trying to make this for a gathering, a very impromptu gathering that someone said, you know, it's the season and I'll buy everything and, you know, we'll drop it off and you can just make it. Well, I started, I said, well, you'll have to give it to me three days before the start, you know, when we're going to serve this dinner. And uh, what I did was I prepared the meat stuffing first. I prepared the chilies uh, the night before and made sure that they were very dry and that they weren't overly uh, prepared, not too roasted, not too fried. They just, you know, to keep that because even in the refrigerator, even with a uh, paper towel surrounding them, they will start to wilt. So, I would not recommend this for one person, unless you're making a very small amount, which I can't imagine. If you're going to go to all the trouble of making chile singer, you want at least a dozen, <laughs> a dozen, all right? So as of this moment, it's become almost, because of the difficulties, and you used to be able to have a cook or a girl that would help out. You don't have those luxuries. I know I don't. If I can get my cleaning girl to come in once every three weeks, that's a miracle. You know, she's in such demand. Uh, and um, to do something like this, you need a lot of extra hands if you're going to be making it for a party. So I know we're not allowed to, to um, kind of, uh, tell you about all our favorite restaurants, but there are at least five restaurants in Mexico City, get in touch with me later, uh, which I highly recommend for Chile Segnogada. Doug, we've tried at least two or three. I at least. <laughs> at least. And it's almost become- In a, one day. <laughs> in one day. <laughs> and it's become almost a tradition. Let's go and see who's got the best chilies now. You know, so uh, I think Paco also commented about the cafe chinos, the Chinese cafes. Well, there's one in the historic center that's been around since the 1920s, one of our favorite people who does make a wonderful Chilean nogada. And when he has it, he puts it on the menu. And if you don't get there before the comida hour, within the first half an hour, they're all gone, no matter how many he prepares. So, uh, yeah, Chile Segnogada. I, I prefer, uh, if I'm not going to have any help, I prefer to go out and taste them from all the people who are such wonderful cooks and chefs here in Mexico City. Let me ask you a question, both you and Paco. Two things. Um, you were going to comment on the pros and cons of buying the nuez de Castilla, either peeled and cleaned or in its shell. You were going to mention that. And also, I read a few weeks ago, um, as you know, we were talking with Doug about this presentation, I read somewhere that the chile en nogada started as a dessert, that originally, because a lot of people say that it was, a, you know, the myth goes, and I'm not sure which is the myth and which is the, the, the actual historic d data, um, that it was prepared as a dish for the emperor for Iturbide. And, but then in another place, I read that it started a dessert, as a dessert. It did not even have meat, and it started changing. So which, which is the, well, the history of it? I'll answer the walnut question, and then I'll okay. let Paco answer uh, legends, myths, and what do you really believe? Walnuts. Um, I have never, ever, for anyone that I've prepared chile en nogada, purchased the walnut in the shell. First of all, because it would take 
hours upon hours of cracking just the outer shell and then to peel the inside and try to keep the meat as, as whole as possible. That's difficult. Plus, by the end of it, your fingers are all blackened. All right. So two things. I And here in the Mercados, I mean, in Medellin, I really prefer Jamaica, uh, which is not far from Condesa, Roma, or any of the central areas of the city. There's even a subway stop that's called the Jamaica subway stop. They always have wonderful walnuts already peeled and ready to go. And uh, what I do though, is that I will go and I say, I want half a kilo. I've never needed more than half a kilo, which is only 1.2 pounds. And I say, I'd like some walnuts, but can you peel them now for me? And they will, they'll peel them while you wait. Now Paco, myths, legends, and was it really a dessert? Before we go to Paco, I have a question. Oh. Yes. Uh, what do you think about freezing the nut? Never. Oh, freezing the nut? Yes. Yes. The freezing the nut, yes. Many people do it. Now, you're going to see that there's some restaurants in Mexico City, and I'm thinking of one in particular, which is up near Santo Domingo, won't mention its name. I think I've gone too far already, that has chiles en nogadas all through the year. And I've had people tell me, it's very good. And I once had them out of season there. No, <laughs> you can freeze the walnuts, but I wouldn't freeze them for more than a month. It's a nut. You're never going to get that vacuum seal that you need unless you have one of those little machines and really know how to use it. And to have walnuts all through the year, fresh walnuts, I, I don't think that's possible. And I'm very much into eat seasonally. So the fruits, are only during a specific period, which is why the chiles and nogada are only during a specific period. Thank you. So, myths, legends, Paco? Yes, well, um, I want to say a little bit uh, about the, the people that like uh, or know the chile nogada. I think that a lot of people like it, and the ones that don't, that don't like it is because uh, they have to peel the, the nuez. Uh, I have a friend called uh, Ben Herrera, uh, another colleague. Uh, he had the tragedy to uh, come from a family who owned a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> he hates the chile nogada because of the reason that he spent one week peeling the skin of the Nuez de Castilla. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very hard job if you want to do it yourself. Maybe in the past it was most, more easy because you have many family members as, as uh, Ruth just mentioned it or you have a business and you, you want it to be authentic. So uh, I have seen so many restaurants they, they want to fool you giving you pecan uh, uh, so instead of the Castilla. So that's not a Chile en Nogada. No? You cannot eat a Chile en Nogada in March, please, because uh, it requires ingredients that are depends on its seasonality and like the, uh, we have named it, the Granada Roja, uh, La Pera de San Agustin, Manzana Panochera, uh, ingredients that are good in season precisely uh, uh, at the end of July, August, September. And then um, uh, regarding the, the tradition or the legend, I, I never mention it because it is not true that uh, the dish was presented to uh, the, the emperor, Iturbide, Iturbide was not the emperor at that moment. It was the, the leader of the independence revolution together with Guerrero. And they create this Ejército Trigarante, the Ejército of the Trigarantes that we talk about. Uh, um, and then they wanted to, to link it to the colors of the flag and the colors of the Chile. But uh, according to the historians and the experts, Iturbide was not in Puebla uh, by the time of the consumacy. He was uh, before and he was after in the city of Puebla. But it is a, a very romantic legend that many people believe, want to believe. Uh, and they organize, as I said before, these expeditions to Puebla to find the, uh, the flavors that the, the emperor, because he's going to um, become emperor after this fails to establish a Republica in Mexico with the, with the first president, Guadalupe Victoria. And then he is going to decide to be the, the first emperor of Mexico. 
uh, um, for a very ephemeral uh, length of time, no? So this is what is about the, the legend. And I think we have another question, no? I miss it. No, that was, that was my, my question was about the, 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 the romantic, as you say, history that it was prepared for Iturbide. And the second question was, I read somewhere that this started as a dessert. It was a dish, la nogada, and it was a dessert, and it did not include myth, uh, meat. I, I'm sorry. I don't know if that's true or not. It, that, I read that, it in an article a few weeks ago. Do you the want nogada, to? Yeah, yeah. The nogada sauce is actually as well uh, a um, crossover from the sauces of Spain that had strong Moorish influences. So these sauces could be made very sweet. You know that there are nut sauces that, that are, can be made sweet. You, you garnish your sundaes with nuts. There, you, know, you do nut butters um, that you could put jelly on with it. So there's always been this um, almost symbiotic uh, flavors of uh, nuts and something sweet. Now, as to having been a dessert, I don't think that that's more of a legend and a myth. Right. Even though I have a wonderful recipe, which I'll share very quickly here. Uh, when you have ancho chilies that are whole and beautiful and still very flexible, which is how all of your dried chilies should be. I wish I had one right now. It should be movable. It shouldn't crack. It shouldn't have any white to it. If you take a long ancho chili and you do a piloncillo or the coned uh, molasses uh, raw sugar and do it into a syrup, you put in your piloncillo um, syrup, the dried ancho chili, you let it sit there for at least 15 minutes to half an hour, depending on how soft. You take it back out again, you scrape out uh, the seeds, and then you can do a fruit compote, stuff the dried chili with the fruit compote, and garnish it with some creme fraiche. I also heard the legend of the sweet uh, chile en nogada, and that was my answer to it. Thank you. Yeah, and um, Aliki, I have uh, also another thing to say. This is probably the, the oldest cookbook where it comes uh, documented. Uh, um, it has many recipes. There are three books, three volumes, as a matter of fact. This is a facsimile edition from 1831. And it has many recipes about chile rellenos. A lot of chile relleno recipes of all kinds, not only poblanos, but also anchos, like, like Ruth was saying. And uh, uh, there, there is a, also a recipe, many recipes about how to make uh, salsas or sauces. And um, it describes how to make a sauce with the, with the nuez de castilla, with the nogada, to make nogada, no? And probably that's the origin of, 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 of this discussion about if it if the chile nogada was a dessert before uh, it became a main dish, uh, I think that that has to do with the fact that uh, there were many recipes shared by many families in Puebla mainly uh, that uh, used to use many different uh, ingredients and and testings uh, to have the very best. No, Every, everyone wanted to have uh, the best chile nogada at at, at table. And, uh, and and this has to do also with many preparations to to uh, come with a seaside plate to enjoy the the, the chile relleno. In some moment, in, in some happy moment, uh, some nuns must have been uh, have this idea to drop the, the the nogada sauce on top of one of these chile rellenos, and here it comes the the chile nogada. No, that's what I believe. So many Thank legends, you. so many myths. The nuns are well known. Their convent kitchens were the ones that had the money. They had the servants as well. It wasn't always the nuns. This is why they say that, you know, mole, the mole poblano uh, was actually created in uh, um, uh, the convent uh, for nuns. But you have to remember these nuns themselves weren't always the creators of these recipes. They had their servants who were mostly the indigenous population. And they brought all of those other flavors, the pre-Hispanic flavors into it. And uh, just as another aside, I think I, I did mention that some people uh, will use shredded meat instead of ground meat because ground meat, well, you know, if you were using a metate, 
the lava stone, grinding stone, it would take a hell of a lot to grind meat. So I believe that probably original chiles en nogada, the meat was shredded. And now because of all of these great chefs, and I'm thinking again of one restaurant in particular, they're offering seafood chiles en nogada. Is it going to, to be To each his own. To eat his own, exactly. Now, Doug, you wanted to ask something a while back, and we didn't get to you. Well, I was just going to say, and it's great to see you, Ruth, and also uh, Paco. It's really great to see both of you. I'm sorry. We, we used to see each other all the time, and then there's something called COVID happened, and, and we don't. Um, but um, So I'm not bound by all of these restrictions that you and Paco are, but if I were on Miguel Angel de Cabedo, and I were near the, if I were near the Centro Vero Cruzano, I would go in and see if I could find a chili de nogada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that good and enough? <laughs> and tell Chef Anna we sent you. Uh, and, and, and ask if you can't ask for Anna. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And tell her we sent you because yeah. they really are. But and I didn't, there, had, was, there was no mention of a, of a restaurant name. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. But she has a strong uh, Veracruzan um, uh, uh, menu. But when it comes to the chile en nogada, oh my God. I think I went last summer, we went once, uh, Doug, and then I went again about a mm -hmm. week later. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, Just twice that. a day. <laughs> <laughs> Very um, good. Just for just another, the, the book that uh, you showed in your bibliography, one of the LaRousse books uh, was uh, by uh, Alicia Gironella. And yes. she is the original owner, is that correct, Ruth, of yes, that restaurant? Was. And so it's uh, the LaRousse uh, uh, Gastronomique Mexicana, whatever the name is, I can't remember. There's two yes. of them that you showed yeah. in the bibliography. Yeah. Hers is uh, from the uh, late 18, 1980s, early 1990s. Mm -hmm. And she was one of our foremost culinary stars, uh, giants, because she actually was one of those innovative women uh, chefs before, the, you know, they were like call chefs who uh, tried to maintain um, the integrity of uh, Mexican recipes and Mexican mm -hmm. cuisine. So just as a, an aside there. Thank you. And Paco is showing us the, uh, Paco, can you speak? Because since we're on speaker view so that we can see the book oh, yeah, and the page sure. you opened. Absolutely. Yeah, this is the book that uh, our dear friend Doug is talking about. This is the, the La Russe of the Mexican cuisine. It was written by Alicia Gironella and, uh, and her husband, Giorgio De Angeli. And it was a very interesting book with many techniques and of course, it has to come its own um, uh, version of the Chile Nogada is one of the sources uh, to uh, to uh, prepare them. And it has many um, um, differences between other Chiles. And it has uh, also, they decided to include the legend. This is uh, uh, Iturbide, you know, uh, they, they talk about Iturbide. But it, it changes briefly some ingredients that are very interesting. So, uh, yeah, but again, there are like 30 some uh, ingredients to make the, the, the right chile, no? This is another good book, unfortunately, only in Spanish that you can yeah. find in, in bookstores. Thank Mark you, Paco. has a question, and I think we all know that the most popular of the um, photographers and food stylists for the majority of these books has been uh, Ignacio Urquiza, better known as Nacho Urquiza. He has over 30 books that he's photographed. A few of them are his own, and he does some marvelous work. He's uh, a photographer first, uh, cum food stylist, and um, most any chef worth his salt wants Nacho to photograph his books. So yeah, that was Nacho Urquiza, um, and you can find a great many of his books uh, in Gandhi, Librerias Gandhi. And as well as all of these books, you can find them in Libreria Gandhi's as well. And there Thank is a you. specific, there is one specific book. I mean, if you're really, really interested in Chile Rellenos, there is one book called uh, the Chile Rellenos book, uh, and I'll mention his name, uh, Ricardo Munoz Zurita. 
He is the investigator, uh, chef, author of the Chile Rellenos book, which actually has, uh, it's a bilingual edition, isn't there? Yeah, there's a bilingual edition. So it's English and Spanish. That's the last thank I have to say. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much to Ruth Alegria, Paco de Santiago, Doug Hall, um, a shout out to Doug for introducing us to Ruth and Paco and, and getting this together. It has been really, really an incredible experience. I, I, you made me hungry. I am incredibly mm -hmm. sad. I can't go to your houses to eat a chile nogada because as I told you at the beginning, it is my favorite dish ever. But mm -hmm. I want to give a little, you know, plug to the American Benevolent Society. Um, every year, our own Jenny Mosier prepares, and I'm sharing the picture, for our volunteers. So I'm sure some of you have mm -hmm. tried it before. Um, she prepares chile de nogada, you know, around this time, late August, beginning of September. And she, we used to have a lunch for our volunteers, and she would make herself these chiles and nogadas and decorate the, the plates. And so this is the one thing that we're missing with this COVID pandemic, among other things. We're missing that fantastic lunch, but this is what our own ABS used to do. So what do you think, Ruth and Paco, of the presentation? It's very beautiful with those flowers, which I hope are edible, because one of the main things is never serve anything that's not edible on your plate. And those flowers look very gorgeous. Uh, I think she has gone for the uh, slightly more textured sauce. You can tell right off. I mean, just looking at it, they're a little um, granular bit. So she has decided to, to use that texture which I think is wonderful. Um, I like a little bit, again, I don't like the over-processed sauces. Um, if you over-process your sauce, there's always the danger that it will break, that it won't hold together. And then you'll be putting in more cheese, more cheese, and more cheese, and you don't want to do that. So that's a very lovely presentation, yes. Thank you. So we- I, hope I, love, the, I love the ABS uh, letters, no, on the plate. And the nogada looks yeah. very fresh, yeah. I wish yeah. we could have them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah. hope that, that this time next year, um, we will be together physically, not just virtually. We will have a chance to hug each other, to meet each other in person, to be together, and to enjoy this fantastic and wonderful dish. And I can't thank all of you enough for, for being with us. And Ruth, Paco, really, this has been the highlight. Um, it is fantastic. And thank you so much for, for sharing your time, for being with us. And there's nothing else I can say except for a huge thank you to all of you. Um, if there's any other questions or wrap up, Thank you for having us. Uh, really uh, uh, want to say that it's been uh, so wonderful to be able to talk about uh, some of our favorite things. I'm sure Paco joins me in this, right Paco? Hey, absolutely. No, thank you again for the invitation. It's really so exciting to be sharing this with all of you. Thank you for, for coming to this conference. And I hope that we have uh, enjoyed uh, these minutes that we cannot uh, be together, but in the next future will be. In the meantime, it's so nice to, to watch your faces, to listen to your voices, to know that you are alive and willing to enjoy life. No, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone, so, so much. Um, and we will, we will see you. We will see you soon and have a great week. And if anyone has